Praise God. Well, we're going to go ahead and jump right in here this morning. Uh, Jim, did you take the other paper that was up here by chance with your papers? It's okay. Can I have that, please? Not that that's like my sermon notes or something, but <laughs> appreciate that. Thanks. Amen. So if you've been uh, here, you know that we're in the middle of a series and we're addressing what I'm calling the four dominant needs of the human heart. We started off with the idea of, above everything else, the most important need each one of us have is to know God. Without question, it is the most dominant need of our heart. It's the reason we were created by God. We were created by God for God. Okay? And if we're not in a relationship with God, there will always be a void in our heart. That's just the way it is. You either believe that or you prove it, but it is what it is. By design, created for God. And uh, we said that when you know God, there are levels of knowing. And uh, Jesus, to one group, said, depart from me. I didn't, never knew you. And they were quoting all kinds of religious activities they had been engaged in. But just because people go to church or engage in religious activities does not mean they know God. That's solid Bible teaching right there. And so we said there, you know, th this relationship thing with God is paramount. It's the most important thing you'll ever engage in. It's a lifelong activity. Even the Apostle Paul is found, who clearly knew the Lord, but he's found in Philippians 3 saying what? That I might know him. He's still crying out for a deeper knowing. So we said there's levels of knowing. Each one of us should be um, invited and challenged to reach for more of God and to know him in a deeper, more meaningful way. We said one of the reasons um, that people kind of plateau in knowing God or having a meaningful relationship with God is because there's a cost attached. Every meaningful relationship comes with a price. You don't have meaningful relationships without sacrifice without covenant, without relational stuff. It costs something to have meaningful relationships. And so we've been uh, examining the prize so that we'll be willing to pay the price. Come on. A lot of people spend a lot of time talking about the price, but they don't talk about the prize, and therefore they have no power to pay the price. But when you see the prize, you know, Paul says, I count all this other stuff but rubbish trash that I might win Christ. I've seen the prize, and therefore this stuff that I used to count so dear and precious, all of my degrees and accolades among the religious groups that he was flowing with meant nothing to him anymore. He didn't need the praises of men. He was looking simply for the praise of God because he had seen him in his beauty and in his glory. So we do well to spend time like we just did pondering the depths and the beauty of his love for us and the benefits of the relationship and really what we've been invited into. It's, it's a lifelong thing. We're, we're supposed to be cultivating like you would cultivate a garden, tend the weeds and give it what it needs to grow and flourish. We also said that in this idea of knowing, we're talking about the four dominant needs of the human heart. To know is a huge need, but not just to know God. It starts there to know one another. By God's design, we were created not to be solo. That's what the Bible teaches. The eye cannot say of the hand, I have no need of you. The reality is we actually need each other. And if we're not rightly related and connected to other people, so to know people, um, then there'll be a void in our life as well. There'll be an empty space in our life. Something will be missing, and you can try to fill it with all kinds of other stuff, but I'm just here to tell you, God designed us to be a part of a family that is functional, not a dysfunctional family. Relationships that are meaningful, that are, that are quality, but here's the reason people plateau in relationships. The same reason they plateau in a relationship with God is because there's a cost to meaningful relationships. It costs you something 
to have to work through and problem solve together. You know, problem solving isn't fun when people have different vantage points and ways of thinking and personality types and, and things in their heart that they have to get over. And it's, it's costly business. But if you're like me and, and you're looking for something that's deep and lasting and meaningful, you look at the prize of the benefit, what it really feels like and what it's like to have meaningful relationships, quality relationships with people, and the benefit far exceeds the cost attached, although at times it's questionable. <laughs> I mean, there are just times when you're going, I'm not so sure this is worth it, but usually after you spend a little time meditating on it, you say, yeah, it's worth it. It's, it's worth it. So we talked about knowing. That's knowing God. We took a moment. I'm not going to go there today. I'm just giving you my quick recaps like I always do. It would be amiss to not acknowledge that we also need to know ourselves. This is based on the great commandment. What is the great commandment? Jesus' answer is real straight up. Love God, number one. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Meaning, the sequence would be love God. Out of loving God, you should learn to love yourself. Not in a selfish way, but in a way that is God, I am, like David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Like, I'm a reflection of you. I'm in your image. I'm, I, I have a value. And, and it's interesting because the, the world tries to squeeze us into its mold and make us feel like to be valued, you have to act a certain way, dress a certain way, drive a certain vehicle, do certain things. And, you'll, and if you do all these things just right, you'll be loved and accepted by the world. But God is saying, that is such a twisted version of you. It's not the real you. It's the spirit of the world. It's the spirit of the age. It's a perverted thing. And that's why Jesus said, if you'll lose that life, you'll find your real life. The real you is not that. It's something different. And so many times, you know, we, we, we're disconnected from God. We're disconnected from ourselves. We don't know who we really are. God wants to set us free from all that stuff. And we don't know one another very well. So in all of these things, there's a price to pay. Having truth, having, uh, you know, we've just come through the 10 days of awe where there was supposed to be a time of introspection and self-examination. And we're, 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 we're not doing that in some type of beat ourselves up manner as much as like David, God, search me and see. Psalms 139. Lead me in the way everlasting. I long to know you more intimately and deeply and and all of these areas. So those are huge things. They're lifelong in nature to know God, to know ourselves, to know each other. We said secondarily flow. We spent the, the next thing that's essential to the human heart being fulfilled and satisfied. Jesus said, if you believe on me, any man's thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me out of his heart will begin flowing a river of living water. But then he said, this is not just some you know, experience a person has. This is a person that begins flowing because he makes it clear in John's Gospel, chapter 7. This spake Jesus of the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, who had not yet at that time been given because Jesus had not been glorified. But all that fast forward, we know he has been given now. He's available to each one who believes. And we spent last week talking and delving into God's desire for not only for you to know Jesus, but out of your knowing, and that's why I, this next thing to flow, I like to call overflow. It's really the overflow of the knowing peace. It's knowing God in such a way that you can't contain him anymore. It's uncontainable. To know him in, in a meaningful way, to take it up a notch, it says there's got to be something that spills out because I'm knowing him. and You cannot know him and, and contain that. There's something so eternally expanding about who God is. He, he's constantly, they say even the universes and the galaxies, even to this day, are still expanding. And it's, it's his na very nature. So we spent last week talking about the overflow. We talked about the baptism second feast that the, every person should celebrate, which would be Passover first feast, get saved, get born again. Second feast, Pentecost, be filled with the Spirit. Not just one time, by the way. We looked at a couple examples of how they were filled again. Now, I believe in the initial, you know, baptism. But oftentimes, 
we get clogged pipes. And God wants to unclog us. And so we've got a bunch of holy spurts, not a bunch of holy spirits and all that stuff going on in Christianity. God's looking for a people that are flowing. So just as it was on the first issue of knowing God, it's first about us knowing God himself. It's also secondarily about us knowing each other, right? The same principle applies here with flow. Flow, initially, primarily, is about the Holy Spirit's flow in the life of a believer. The overflow out of your heart will flow. This is going to happen if you believe and trust and drink deep of Jesus. You're going to have an overflow coming out of your life. Thank God for that. But there's also a secondary element, and I find this pattern is true throughout these four, all four of these things we're talking about. To know, to flow, to go, and to grow. Those are the other ones we're going to be talking about eventually here. But this dynamic applies to all four of those, and it's this, is that there's first a to Godwardness about it, and then there's a collective corporateness about it. And so when it comes to flowing today, I want to talk about flowing together versus just me flowing. I'm satisfied in Jesus. I'm drinking deep of Jesus. I'm believing in Jesus, and out of my heart is now flowing something. Yay, thank God for that. But I'm not supposed to just flow alone. I'm supposed to flow with people. And, and this is an interesting thing because sometimes you can flow against people. You can flow against the purposes of God with your so-called flow. And, and that's not what God's ultimate intention is. So we want to flow on a personal level first. And then out of that flow, we want to see how our individual flows. Each of us has a unique flow from the Spirit given to us. You know, the Spirit is given, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And then Paul goes into a whole discourse on how we're supposed to edify the plan of God, the people of God, and the purposes of God through whatever flow or manifestation of the Spirit is occurring in the life of the believer. It's not just my show flow. We got a lot of my show flow stuff going on, and God's saying, stop making it about you and start making it about the bigger picture, about the kingdom advancing. Lose your individual drip and become a part of a river. Become a part of something much mightier than your individual flow is about. Although it starts with that, it has to become what God's looking for. So the reason there are different levels of knowing God is because of a cost. The reason there are different levels of flowing with God is because there is a cost to flow. It just is. There's a cost. You know, it's amazing to me how many people are afraid to yield themselves to the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit because they're afraid it'll cost them their reputation. It'll seem silly to hear somebody praying in an unknown tongue. It'll seem weird to there's there's like oh what are people gonna think about me is a cost to flow and you got to be willing to pay that price to get over yourself if you want the deeper flow you don't want the deeper flow you can play it all safe you know and, and and act like you got something going on but i'm just here to tell you if you want and i want what god really has for us there's a cost attached to that flow same thing is true relationally when we're talking about flowing together Flowing together. Jeremiah 31 and verse 12. Therefore, they shall come and sing in the height of Zion. Now listen to this. And shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord. For wheat and for wine and for oil and for the young of the flock and of the herd. And their soul shall be as a watered garden and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Now, this is a prophetic promise, yes, to Israel, but go, come on, don't miss this. To the people of God in general, know you not that you are and I am a part of the seed of Abraham because the seed wasn't many but singular, and that seed is Christ. And those who are in Christ are a part of this covenant promise. And so here we stand today, thankful to be included and all that God has promised us here, and basically he's saying they're going to come and sing in the height of Zion. I tell you, one of the wonderful ways of God getting us in a common flow is through worship. Aren't you grateful? I, I tell you, I love our worship team. I'm so grateful for them. Come on, shout out to Lord for them. They're just awesome. They spend a lot of time hanging out with God, and 
and having their own hearts raked across the coals and all kinds of stuff to stay pure and clean. And it's, it's a warfare zone. Man. I'm just telling you, it doesn't come without a cost. It comes with a cost. And, uh, but I'm grateful. And, and it's just one way that facilitates spiritual flow, collective in nature. It's not just you over here and me over there, but we can actually flow together in some stuff. And we should learn how to do that better, by the way. We do, we have, a, we have, I thank God for the flow we have. It's precious. But I'm just telling you, it's just the starting point of something. There's a flow that's coming that takes your feet. You know, look at Ezekiel's River. There's ankle deep stuff. There's shin deep stuff. There's thigh deep stuff. There's, there's waist deep stuff. And then all of a sudden, there's waters you can't even touch the ground on. And we're heading to that place where we're being carried by the Spirit. Holy men spoke as they were carried by the Spirit lifted out of their human ability to control the situation and just moved by the Spirit of God. This is where God's bringing us, and, you know, it, it's something he'd love for us to cooperate with. He'd love for us to understand it so that we can cooperate with it, okay? So this is a call from God and a promise from God that we could flow together, and then these References for wheat, for wine, for oil, these are all symbols of revival. These are harvest symbols, but they're revival symbols. And, you know, here we stand at the last feast of Israel's uh, religious calendar, which we, these were harvest feasts, which absolutely speak to us about a final ingathering and a final culminating of all that God's been working throughout his historical plan. And we're standing on the edge of such anticipation as we've heard in the meeting already today live in anticipation of what's happening god has promised something we have tasted of it now the bible has says we have what's called the earnest of the spirit these are the first fruits of the spirit but they're the down payment for what's going to happen it's a guarantee just like you have an earnest payment if you're making a bank deal and you're going to the table to sign for uh, uh, you know, some type of uh, sales agreement, there's earnest money, and it's the guarantee of the full price that will be paid. It says, I'm locking in on this thing, and I'm just here to tell you, God has locked in and said, you will have the full thing. I'm going to give it all to you. It's coming by way of promise. To flow together. Here's what this word flow together, this phrase flow together in the Hebrew language means. It is the Hebrew word nahar. And here's what it means. Check this out. To sparkle. So don't be a dull Christian. If you want to flow together, flowing together is to sparkle. That is to be cheerful. Oh, it's so convicting. From the sheen of a running stream to flow, to assemble, to be lightened, to flow together, to sparkle. It reminds me of a vision. I've shared it before. Some of you have heard it. Some of you have not. But it comes to mind. I'm going to share it again. I was, when my daughter Rebecca was born, <clears throat> was over at St. Vincent's Hospital in Jacksonville, up on, I forget, up some high floor there, and she had just been born. It was my first child, the miracle of a first child. I just remember just being in such awe of God. And uh, I had to go down and wait for a little while because they were doing some stuff uh, with her mother. And I had to go down to the end of the hall. And there was this atrium on the end that overlooked the St. John's River. And I was there, and I was just sitting there in this state of awe. Wow, I have a little girl. Amazing. And uh, all of a sudden, I had a vision. And I'm not, like, given to these things. I don't have them all the time. I don't, you know, say it in some kind of flippant way. It was a very real vision, just like the Bible talks about. I looked out on the St. John's River, and there was a golden ray of sunshine coming across the river, sparkling, just like this word we just read in the Hebrew language states, to sparkle as if a glistening stream, okay? But it was like this golden, the sun was on the river, and there was, uh, it wasn't like really choppy choppy, but it was enough that it was like reflecting all these little glittery sunlight sparkles. And I'm looking at it, and all of a sudden, the whole thing shifted, became very spiritual. It was like, you know how when something goes from 
the, a natural realm to a spiritual realm, often it has this kind of like gentle movement to it. And it was just kind of like gently, the edges became soft to my vision. And it was just gently moving. And I was staring at it. And I was being pulled into this. Something, I knew something was going on. It was just amazing as I beheld it. And all of a sudden, the little sparkles I saw turned into people. They were golden people walking on the water. Every sparkle was a person, golden in nature, just like the sunlight, standing on the water. And I heard the words, these are the overcomers. These are the overcomers. And I'm thinking, amazing. What in the world? Like, I'm just down here celebrating the birth of my daughter. And all of a sudden, I'm having this totally off-guard vision of sparkling golden people walking on water, and God says to me, these are the overcomers. Fast forward. <clears throat> the gal I was married to, seven years in, no longer wanted to be married. There was another man involved, wanted a divorce. I ended up moving out, moved in with the Myers, was, was the, with them for three and a half years, was working at a paper mill, got a nasty ear infection at the paper mill because all the steam and the stuff going on around these tanks I was working around. And it was like a fungal thing, and they couldn't knock it out. I kept going back and forth to specialist in Jacksonville, and it was, it was such a dark, difficult season of my life, just dark, hard. Missing my then wife, feeling totally rejected, couldn't see my kids because I was working swing shift, and I'm there in Jacksonville fighting an ear infection. And um, I pull up in the garage one day, just so beat down. Parking garage, I pull up, and I start crying. I'm just having a moment. And I look out over the St. John's River, because the parking garage looks right out over the river, and the same, now it wasn't a vision at that point, but it was a golden row of sunshine on the river and the Lord reminds me of this vision this is the overcomer you're one of them to sparkle to, 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 to sparkle and to walk on water it's miraculous it's, it's by the spirit it's not by the flesh and you're going to make it you're going to make it through Over and over again, this challenge to stay the course when it's not feeling very stayable. I have to do my best today to encourage you and hopefully encourage myself as I encourage you. <laughs> Help him, Lord. Come on, say it, with, say it with my brother. Help him, Lord. <laughs> Trials will come. What are you going to do? What am I going to do when they come? Will we allow God, because it's not a work of our flesh, it's a work of the Spirit, to cause us in the midst of such adverse situations to still sparkle, not out of your own generating, I'm just going to come to church and be sparkly today. Good luck with that. Amen. Let me tell you, that, that, that approach will just show how much you don't sparkle. And then we'll get past us and into another realm once we've gotten over ourselves and we've tapped into another realm, another source for life. This idea of flowing together will come at a price, but it is corporate in nature, and a lot of people are fleeing from the dealings that occur relationally with one another. Now, I'm just talk, I'm talking straight up today. We cannot flee these dealings and expect to be an overcomer. Jesus' words to the church of Asia Minor in the book of Revelation are to churches collectively. And he says repeatedly to them, to him that overcomes, I will grant. 
He's talking to believers that are in relationship with each other, and he's exhorting them, overcome in the context of the congregation, which is relational. You know, they say, you know, there's a lot of people talking about overcomers. The only problem is they never come over. You can overcome all by yourself somewhere, you think. Go ahead. But overcome what? Jeremiah 51, 44. This is an interesting portion of Scripture. And I will punish Baal or Baal in Babylon. And I will bring forth out of his mouth that which he has swallowed up. And the nations shall not flow together anymore unto him. Now let me just say this to you. Well, let me finish reading the verse. Yea, the wall of Babylon shall fall. And my people, go you out of the midst of her and deliver ye every man his soul from the fierce anger of the Lord. This is a prophetic exhortation again from the prophet Jeremiah. God speaking through Jeremiah. And, and basically he's saying there's coming a day when I'm going to judge this spirit of Babylon and this Baal, it's a demonic thing that's, let me just say it another way. You're going to flow together somehow. You know, they loaded Jews on rail cars and took them to concentration camps to destroy them together. Together. Gathered them up, said, oh, we're just taking you to these work camps for a season. You're going to just be, you know, take your clothes off. Don't worry about it. And they, and, they, and they killed them. They exterminated them together. And I'm just telling you, if you and I are avoiding together stuff, we're going to miss the point here because Babylon, here according to the Scripture, has been swallowing up people. And, it, and the promise is, God says, I'm going to judge this thing. It will no longer... They, they will no longer flow together in the demonic way because I'm coming to judge it. Thank God for that. But how many people have been swallowed up and are being swallowed up with a whole nother type of flow? So flow, if you really want to strip it back, isn't optional. You're going to flow together. The question is, which group are you flowing with and where are you headed? Where are you going? There's, there's, there's two main flows, just like there's two main rivers, just like there's two main women in the Scripture. You've got the harlot. We'll talk about her in just a moment. And you've got the bride. You've got, you know, the river of God, which brings life, found in Ezekiel. And then you've got the river that comes out of the serpent's mouth in the book of Revelation that's seeking to devour and destroy. And these things, we have to choose where we're going to flow, where we're going to be. The first verse we read talked about flowing together to the goodness of the Lord. But let me just say the flowing together to the goodness of the Lord, I believe, is under attack in a lot of ways. Let me say why or what I mean by this. Because today we live in an age where technology, it's a two-edged sword, most would agree. Such a blessing in so many ways and such a curse in so many ways. You know, there are people, uh, and if you're watching online today, please don't take this wrongly. Unless, of course, you're supposed to. But we've created cultures where you can do church at home only. And there's no cost attached to relationships. Or I can simply pull up my phone and listen to the latest, greatest podcast from some preacher. Pick and choose what I want. Never have to deal with awkward personalities that I don't like. Come on, to him that overcomes is in the context of relationships. It's good preaching. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. It's the truth. We're, we're just at a time where this technology thing is a blessing, but we're overfed sometimes. Because, and, we're, and, and the question becomes, are we just feeding on... Men shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, meaning I just want to hear what I want to hear when I want to hear it, and if I don't like it, I'll click the button and find someone I want to hear. 
That's why Jesus said, whatever city you go into and whatsoever house you enter into, first say, peace be to this house. And if the son of peace is there, there abide. And then he says this, eat whatever they serve you. I got people, it's amazing how many people come to church and say, oh, I felt the presence of the Lord here. This is where I'm supposed to be forever. I feel the peace of God. The son of peace is here. Until somebody serves them something they don't want to hear. That's not what Jesus said. He said, as a matter of fact, takes it a, he takes it a notch up and he says, don't go from house to house. I was doing good there till they said something like that. I got a little offended. Okay, what you going to do with it? To him that overcomes. Where? In the house. Among the people of God. The relationships, the flowing together. Not just you and the Holy Ghost. Oh, I love Jesus. And oh, I got the whole, I pray in tongues. Yada, da, ba, sha, da, da, ba, ba, ba. Okay. How's that work with can you say, I'm sorry? Do you know how those words work? I was wrong. I made a mistake. Will you forgive me? Whoa. Can we say those words? Not just shandai bandai. We know the parable of the ten virgins. Let's read it quickly. I've got 15 minutes. You can endure it. Matthew 25, verse 10. And while they were going to buy, this is, I'm picking up midstream on the parable of the ten virgins, the five wise and the five foolish. Most of us know this. If you don't, go back and read it in its full context later. For time's sake, verse 10. And while they were gone, going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and for what was about to come. They thought, I, I got what I need right now. That's all I really need. That's all that really matters. Without any clue that God in his mercies was trying to equip them for what was about to happen. And I have to tell you, I am so deeply convicted that something is about to happen in our world that's going to test the quality of our relationships and our ability to flow together. And if our relationships don't have capacity, they've not been, how do you determine the capacity of something? If I had a wheelbarrow and I wanted to know what its capacity was, how would I decide how much it could hold? I'd load it up. That's what I'd do. I'd load it up to see how much it could hold, how much the tire could hold, how much I could navigate with. Capacity is decided by loading it up and seeing when the wheel starts squeaking and the tire starts going flat and the, or it just runs over the edges. There is your capacity, right? You load it with capacity. So what do you think God's doing to examine our capacity right now? He's loading it up. That's why so, there's so much added stress. It's added stress to unveil our current capacity, and God is saying, um, I think you need a new wheelbarrow. I think you need something with a little more capacity. And by the way, it, if you'll lock arms with others, have meaningful relationships, lean in, pay the price, your capacity will exponentially increase. One, put a 1,000 to flight. Come on, walk with me. Two, how many? 10,000. It's not even just natural math. It's exponential multiplication, supernatural in nature that comes because everywhere brethren are dwelling together in unity, flowing together, there God commands a blessing. He adds to it. And we're just five wise, five foolish virgin stuff going on here right now because God is saying, you might not think it matters, but right now is your window. Right now is your window. This, these words are not coming out of some preacher who thinks, oh, this is just a great message, and I'm going to get everybody to like me if I preach it. I'm preaching this out of a place of desperation, out of a place of conviction. And either I'm just a bunch of hot air or I'm speaking on the basis of God's word, a mouthpiece for God. Let every man that speaks speak as an oracle of God, as a mouthpiece. I have a deep conviction that I'm doing that. Now, you test it. You try it. You see it. But what's the Spirit saying in your life? Where is your relationship rub right now? Uh, 
I was quiet. You say, Pastor, there isn't any. God bless you. Come pray for us. Or talk to you next week. <laughs> you know, we talked about it once before, Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, for time's sake. Uh, you remember the story. They had been fishing all night. They caught nothing. And uh, they had gone out of their boats. They were washing and tending their nets, examining them for breaks and things like that. And at that moment, when they were desperate, discouraged, and just having to tend their nets, I took the illustration of that these nets to me represent relationships, networks, and where, where people connect with other people. And they were being forced to tend them in a time of not being very fruitful. And in that very space, Jesus shows up on the seashide. Sea, she shied. <laughs> we do speak in tongues. <laughs> Say that five times. <laughs> Jesus showed up at the seashide, shows out you. Gets in one of the boats, starts preaching, teaches the people again. And when he finishes preaching, Peter, Simon Peter comes up to his boat, he says, launch out into the deep. And they bring in a, a, a draught of fish that they can't even contain them. And, and they're having to call for help and assistance from their brethren, right? They're so overwhelmed by the whole thing. And then, and then finally, it, it, it's, you know, don't be afraid. You'll no longer be fishing for fish. You're going to be fishing for men. Something radically shifted and happened. I just believe this. This is the season for examining our nets, our relationships. Why? Because there's a harvest coming that not any one person can, can harvest, can get, can get. It'll be lost if we don't have relationships that work and function. That's the bottom line. Isaiah 50, or 65, 8. Thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it, so I will do for my servant's sake and not destroy them all. Do not destroy the cluster because there's a blessing in it. Now, it's a fascinating portion of Scripture. Some people say, well, because some of it was messed up, throw the whole thing away. And the, the prophet is saying, don't throw the whole thing out just because some of it's a mess. You know how people say, the, the church, I've, I'm done with church. Why? Well, because it's all political or it's all, it's all a show or it's all this. Amen, there's a bunch of that that goes on. But don't throw, the wine, don't throw it out, man. There's, there's a blessing in the cluster. Don't destroy it. How would you destroy it? With your words, with your attitude, with your heart. Listen, the body of Jesus was stripped and ripped to shreds when Joseph of Arimathea, a just man, a devout man, came to Pilate and begged for a broken, ripped up body. Give it to me. I'm not asking for it because it's in such good condition. I'm asking for it because of who it is. Wrapped him in fine linen, a picture of righteousness of the saints. Put him put the body of Jesus in his own tomb that he had carved out for himself. We have so many people carving out stuff for themselves and not for the body of Christ. I want my ministry, I want my thing, and it's got to be this way. And you know what? We've got a ripped up, shredded up, bunch of dysfunctional stuff going on in the church today. But the scripture is pretty clear. Don't destroy the cluster because there's a few bad grapes or something's gone sour. Don't destroy the whole thing. It still is the body of Christ, no matter what condition it happens to be in. And there's a blessing, the scripture says here. There's a blessing in the body. Now, it's interesting because, you know, you don't get wine without destroying the grapes. So we're not talking about these grapes don't have to get crushed in the body. Come on, we, we come to church to get crushed and get encouraged and ferment together, and flow together, and my grape no longer is my grape, it's our grape, we're one big grape, squashed out together. Isn't it beautiful? It's just beautiful. It's the new wine. Do not destroy the cluster. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness 
wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. The sound of many waters. Each of us is supposed to have, out of our innermost being, our heart is supposed to flow a river of living water according to the scripture. I know that's the name of this local church. If you're a guest here today, this isn't what we talk about every Sunday. You just happen to be here at a special time. Amen. But it is true that out of the heart of each believer is supposed to flow a river, but God's ultimate plan is for a much bigger expression than your personal experience with the Holy Spirit. Revelations chapter 1 and verse 15. His feet, John seeing Jesus, the, the glorified Christ, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. His voice. Now, you don't want to lose context here. Probably you should come back to the second service if you want a more fuller version of all of this. Maybe we'll get to it. But you can't lose the idea here. Jesus' feet burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. Many waters is a reference to the, the water coming out of you. Come on, out of your heart shall flow a river. But it's not just your river. It's many rivers flowing together. And Jesus, we're talking about his body. Now, he's the head, we're the body. His feet are like burnished bronze that have been refined. And I'm telling you, the church and its corporate expression is being refined in a furnace, heated up, designed to purify, to make the flow, the, the words that come out of our mouth, like we just read in Ephesians, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. The word of the Lord is corporate in this hour, and it's going to come with purity because it's been in the fire and it hasn't bailed like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm going to hang in here even if it costs me everything. Come on. And in that place, the Son of God shows up and sets people free in the furnace, and then he takes them out of the furnace and gives them authority to rule the nation. Glory to God. Burnished bronze. Real quick. Revelations 14, 1, then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of, here it is again, many waters. And like the sound of loud thunder, the voice I heard was like the sound of harpers playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures, and before the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. We're talking about refined people now. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. Now here he goes, and in their mouth... No lie was found, for they are blameless. You see, this refining process we're in right now is where God is, is checking our speech. The accuser of the brethren, which breaks the flow that we have with one another. Even if in your own circle you've managed to keep a decent flow together, thank God for that. But how about your attitude and my attitude toward other movements in the body of Christ? other styles of worship, other ways of doing things that maybe we don't fully see or, or appreciate the same way someone else does. But God's examining judgment begins with the house of God. It's this passing through the midst of us, lighting his candle, getting out his broom, looking for what's his. Luke chapter 15, if you're looking for a reference for that. Jeremiah, come on, I got... I, who will give me five more minutes? Five, 10, 15, 20. Awesome. No, I'm going to just do five. Jeremiah 15, 19. Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. We're talking about 
The voice of the Lord was as the sound of many waters. The speech of the Lord is like the sound of many waters. But it's all connected to this idea of having a clean heart, having a pure heart. And here God exhorts Jeremiah, or through Jeremiah, and he's basically saying, if you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them. Last verse we're going to hit today, Revelations 19 and verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters. Now, if you can't make the connection with this one, I don't know where you're at, because it's very plain. The, the, the many waters is related to a great multitude. It's many people, corporate in nature, that have water flowing from them. We're talking on the topic of flow today and about not just your flow with God, but us being able to flow together to the goodness of the Lord. And here's what he says. I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give glory and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. If you were to go on, you can talk about Babylon who sits upon many waters, always trying to snuff out what God is doing in the corporate expression of the body of Christ. But I just feel the Spirit of the Lord beckoning us. Flow on a personal level. That's where it starts. Know Him and then flow on a personal level with God and the Holy Ghost. But then let's let God help us flow together. Come on. Two have a better reward for their labor than one. There's something about to happen. We have a space of time to allow our relationships to become quality relationships. And it'll cost us all something to have it so. Let me pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I don't know how you do it, Lord, but I'm asking you to just take what words have been spoken here and fit them however you choose to our hearts and our lives. God, I'm not in control of the outcomes of what happens here today. I simply have sought to be obedient to things you've placed within me and stirred upon my heart. And I, I just ask you, God, on a personal level, you know where I'm at. You know the ways that I'm processing all these things on, a, on my own life uh, stage, so to speak, and where I'm having to deal with things in my own life. And I just thank you as a congregation, God, that you've, you've been merciful to us and gracious to us to give us a window of time to work things out before the world moves into a season where the demands on us will become higher than they've ever been, where the need for us to sparkle among the nations and to be a light for the world to see. You said no man puts that candle under a bushel but puts it on a lampstand. And God, I pray that as we allow you to do your work, your deep work in us, that that light would glorify you, that men would see our good works and then be you would be glorified because of it, and people would be drawn to you. And I ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. Praise God. Well, <clears throat> God bless you. There's coffee in the courtyard.